theory for argument. I just wanted to uh, note for you guys out of the um, um, 110 CMR, the, the, the department's regulations about the, sta what the standards for review of what we did the other day, the department's uh, hearing. And I'll just give you the site to it in case you have a look at it. 110 CMR 10.0 is all about the fair hearings process, fair hearings and grievances. And section 10.05 says the standards for review. So this is the standards by which the hearing officer, you know, I remember I was the hearing officer and you guys were all the players, some of you were the players. So a fair, a fair hearing shall address, and then there's three points. Number one, whether the, the department's or provider's decision, and that would have been, um, who played the 51B reporter, I forgot, Leslie. So it would have been whether Leslie's decision was not in conformity with its policies and or regulations and resulted in substantial prejudice to the aggrieved party, and that would have been the tumors. Uh, number two, whether the, the departments, again, or providers' procedural actions were not in conformity with its policies, regulations, or procedures and resulted in substantial um, prejudice to the aggrieved party, or, or number three, if there is no applicable policy, regulation, or procedure, whether the department or provider acted without a reasonable basis, so again, the, that term reasonable, or in an unreasonable manner which resulted in substantial prejudice to the aggrieved party. And then the um, hearing officer shall adjudicate the three previous questions, a decision to reverse a decision of an area director or a clinical review team may only be made with the approval of the commissioner. In making a determination on these questions, the fair hearing officer shall not recommend reversal of the clinical decision made by a trained social worker, again that was Leslie, if there is a reasonable basis for the question decision. Um, and there was something else I want to point out. Yes. Yeah, so the um, 110 CMR, by well, all of 110 CMR are all of the department's reg regulations. This particular one is 110 CMR 10.0, and it's on fair hearings and grievances. And then 110 CMR 10.05 was the standards for review of the, the, the process, the process by which the fair hearing officer would be, you know, um, um, affirming. Or, or, or denying, or, or there was something else, and I just can't find it all of a sudden. No, maybe that was it. I did, oh yes, one tenth, I'm sorry, I'm still in the same section, but one tenth CMI 10.29, um, titled Decision. The hearing officer shall render a written decision within 21 calendar days. So three weeks later is when the two months would get a decision after the close of the record, unless notice is provided to the agreed party that a longer period of time is needed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the hearing officer, and here are the choices. The hearing officer may affirm the challenge decision, reverse the challenge decision, or remand the decision to the area office provider or clinical review team to obtain additional information. So um, now we would be at the place where, you know, so three weeks later, the two must get the decision in the mail that she's affirming Leslie's, you know, 51B uh, uh, decision. And then the two months, just like Mr. Cobble in Cobble the DSS that you read, ultimately go to Superior Court and file a complaint. So that's where we're at, making a legal argument to the Superior Court now using case law as parents for the Tumas on my right side and then um, department attorneys that are in front of me. I wanted to point out, however, just uh, when we did the uh, scenario on Tuesday, uh, here's some other site for you. Remember we were talking about emergency medical care? That's contained in the next section of the CMR is 11, 110 CMR 11, medical authorizations and uh, emergency medical medical care, the site for it is 11.03. And remember I read to you a list of 
you know, some were pretty serious, bleeding, choking, and consciousness, but then the very last one was sort of that catch-all. Any condition with delay in treatment will endanger the life, limb, or mental well-being of the patient. And some people were sort of, you know, arguing that piece of it in terms of the ongoing flu epidemic, et cetera, et cetera. And then routine medical care was the next section, 11.04 of 110 CMR. And in, in routine medical care covered it, it, it didn't cover our scenario, but items like allergy shot, shots, physical exams, dental care, developmental assessment um, you know, of, of children, uh, immunizations, lead poisoning, pregnancy treatment, that sort of thing, um, TB tests and so forth. So I wanted to point out those before we went any further. And now we can begin. And um, I'm not going to have you all introduce yourselves. What what I will do is I'll get on the record as um, as the judge, and um, I may or may not have taken evidence, but it's the purely legal argument now that the attorneys would be making um, I, uh, in I terms just, of the appeal. I just have a question. Like now, if somebody, if like a, a child is having a serious, serious uh, disease, like um, and it's, he's gonna die in a few days if he wasn't treated, and the parents are in court and everything, and they have this religion where they believe if they look at the stars, for example, they will, the kids will be, they really believe that. Uh, will, they, will, will they be held liable if the kid like suffered something or like died or something? Well, which was your last question of it? Well, what? If, if they have like kind of religion where they believe like a certain practice that doesn't have to do with any medical treatment yeah. would cure him. Yeah. And if they believe that, so and if the kid like died because of it. Okay. It I'm gonna have you hold your question because that's the Twitchell case, right. which is one of the cases that you read for today. Um, and I'm and I want you to bring that up in the scope of your argument since you represent the state. Um, and, and, we'll, and we'll discuss it after afterwards. But that's a very good point, and it cuts across where you should be. You know, who would be the petitioner? Would you be then filing a care protection case? Or be the hospital? Would you be filing a case in superior court or whatnot? Yeah. So we will discuss that. Okay. So this is superior court case. Um, two months versus the Department of Children and Families. And I'd be looking first of all for just a representative from either side to give me a sort of opening statement or, or summary of their legal argument on the, on the case. And because the Tumas, uh, um, the plaintiffs in this case, I'll ask for a Tuma uh, attorneys to go first. If any of you volunteer to go first. This whole side. Oh, we're from from Ed all down to Maria. Okay. How about you, Mark? You weren't here the other day. <laughs> you didn't get to play this just two of us, so now you can right. represent him. <laughs> all right, uh, representing the two of us. So, uh, the two of us, the two of us feel that they, uh, the right constitutionally to determine the uh, medical care for their child uh, through any means. That well, they what exactly brought you to file this particular case? What kind of relief would you be looking for? Um, now in the Superior Court? Yes, yeah, so I'm okay. a Superior Court judge. What relief are you looking for? Uh, the relief. Anybody else can help them that's on your side? Amy? Essentially, they had said that there was substantial uh, evidence, uh, sufficient evidence to establish that they was a sus sus suspect of abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you know, we find that there was no, there was not sufficient evidence. You don't find anything, I do. <laughs> we don't, uh, there, is no, there isn't any sufficient evidence, and we want this taken off the record so that the Tumas don't have this on their record ongoing forever, as, you know, they've done everything for their ch family and their children. They came from Nigeria to come here to give them all the opportunities to. 
Now, did your clients exhaust all of their administrative remedies before yes. coming to this point? Yes. And what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course they did. Maria, did your clients exhaust administrative remedies? Yes, they did, because there was a, a fair hearing okay. at the department, and then from that decision. What was the result of the fair hearing? Uh, the fair hearing question. They affirmed it, right? It, right, and why did she affirm it? Why did Ms. Uh, um, call this a firm? Uh, Ms. Leslie's 51B decision? She took it based on the boy's age and condition and the statements of the school personnel and the fact that delaying going to the doctor was going to put him at further risk for injury. Okay. So she took that as, as, a, as a totality of the circumstances. She decided it was. Okay. I'm reading from, um, I know that we, we, on the record, we know that the hearing officer issued detailed findings and she concluded that Freelander's decision was in conformity with the department's policies. And here's her, uh, her exact language. It is reasonable to believe that lack of routine medical care puts this child at substantial risk of physical injury, such as worsening of flu symptoms, fever, ear infection, strep throat, and other possibilities. This constitutes physical and emotional neglect as defined by the time and regulations. So what is the particular nature of parents' of, uh, uh, appeal of this decision? If you could just be a little bit more specific with your beginning arguments. Actually, you know what, I'll, I'll come back to you. Let me hear the, the, the department's initial um, argument as well. Just raise your hand whoever wants to go the first. Department? Is that me, Freelander? That's everybody here. You're all attorneys. Geneva? Um, I would say that there is substantial evidence to support the findings that uh, there was a substantial risk of physical injuries. There is substantial evidence? Yes, and therefore it should be upheld. What's the substantial evidence? The fact that the child was ill with flu symptoms and then was taken out of school because he was so sick. And when the department went to investigate, he was too sick to speak with the investigator. And the parents merely said that he appeared to them to be getting better, even though the child couldn't even speak to the office, the investigator. And as a result, the parents weren't going to take him to see a doctor. And the investigator came back with a report that there was a substantial risk considering the parents had been subjecting the child and were planning on subjecting him further to uh, sacrifice, sacrificing animals, which our investigator felt may harm the child even more. So his question for the department, um, Freelander concluded that the plaintiff's IFA practices and refusal to treat their boy's illness with, quote, routine medical care put the boy at risk. So this point number one. Point number two, she acknowledges that this wasn't a medical emergency, um, but stated that the animal sacrifice and other rituals could perhaps create a heightened risk of physical or emotional harm. Correct. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's supported in the record, Sandy. Leslie's decision. 
Um, referring to the um, Macaulay case, okay. it spoke to religion um, and parents' rights to refuse medical treatment based on the grounds of religion, since here we're discussing routine practices of um, the IFA religion. The state, um, the fundamental principle is it says here that they don't warrant the view that parents have an absolute right to refuse medical treatment for their children on religion. Yeah, I'm sorry, what did you just say? The state, um, parents have an, um, these fundamental principles do not warrant the view that parents have an absolute right to refuse medical treatment for their children on religious grounds. And then it goes on to say that the state has three specific interests in having um, a dangerously sick child receive treatment. And I, I think that speaks to what's happening here with the- What, what are the three interests? The state has an interest in protecting the welfare of the ch children within its borders. Secondly, the state has an interest in the preservation of life, especially when the affliction is curable. Um, I don't know if science has proven that there is a cure for the common cold or the flu, but it's definitely something that needs medical attention because it could potentially get worse. And third, the medical profession is trained to preserve life and to, those, uh, and to care for those under its control and maintaining the ethical integrity of the medical profession. So if you if you represent the parents, how would you distinguish a colleague? If you're trying to compare a child who has the flu to a child who has leukemia, and I think there's a massive difference between the severity of the illnesses that are, are, are being looked at. You're saying potential risk, potential harm, potential, potential, potential. There is not the, the percentage of people that pass away from a flu versus someone from leukemia that is not treated is astronomical. I mean, the, the, the divide is, is huge. Yes. So you're, you're, the, the Macaulay case was all about a blood transfusion for leukemia, and it doesn't uh, doesn't even come close to avoiding. You know, yes, there are parent rights, and there are rights of the child and rights of the state. The parent also has the right to represent their own. You know, they have a freedom of uh, religion, and they have the right to raise their child. Stephanie, right? Yes, I would just. Uh, I would say that, to me, that argument sounds like something like, okay, well, we're going to wait and see until how far this symptom or this, these flu symptoms get and how dangerously sick this child gets before we actually provide care for him. How, how is Macaulay procedurally different from the case that's before me, Council? <coughs> How, in terms of its initiation, what kind of case was this? Who were the plaintiffs in this case? Who was seeking to get what, as opposed to who was seeking to get what right now? And, uh, uh, the doctors, and why is that relevant? Well, the doctors were trying to get a blood transfusion because her counts were so low. And then in order for her to be treated with the chemotherapy, she needed the blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. um, this case, we're asking for her um, tumor's symptoms to be treated with medical care like uh, antibiotic or whatever medical care is being used to treat the flu. Is, is Stephanie right in the, the very last statement that she made? In, in is, Stephanie, is Stephanie right in terms of your position as the state in this case on this case? Uh, procedurally got to this court. But what was the very last thing that you said? Well, I was with you on your argument until your very last statement. Um, Did you get what you just said? Yeah, you said, said here we're seeking. Well, we are seeking for the child to be brought to the hospital or to be brought to a doctor and treated. By Again, the is that true? Is that true, counsel for the department? It's what we Can want. Somebody it's what we want the parents to do, but we're is that true, counsel for parents? No, that is not true. Okay. Okay. The child is healthy. I believe we're seeking to... Um, You're not seeking anything right now. <laughs> Who are the plaintiffs in this case? Ed, and you're a plaintiff, right? <laughs> what are you seeking? We're seeking to have an initial report uh, taken out of the file, not on the record, that these parents were not... Uh, 
neglecting their child. Right, but don't we have the same argument that we were seeking to have that done? That's why we're here. No. 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 But is the question that that you and and the argument that you should be making, I think, to the plaintiff, and I'll ask the plaintiffs this this question. Uh, while you know the procedure in Macaulay and uh, the, the, you know you saw it. I think Amy said it first. You, you, you saw it as parents' counsel initially to distinguish Macaulay by saying Macaulay was so much more serious and whatnot. But in the same vein. Um, the the um, what I'm concerned with right now was just the department's uh, initial threshold determination um, that a report of a ne neglect and abuse should be substantiated. That that's all I'm concerned with. You know, um, that doesn't have to be that serious, right? So how would you argue against that? Anyone? Karen? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, our understanding was that it was a, a supported report on neglect. Um, certainly, if it was a supported report on, on abuse, we could consult Kabul, the Commissioner of Department of Social Services. Which well, you can consult Kabul anyway. Uh, absolutely. Um, and uh, that distinctly spoke about an, uh, requiring an actual physical injury to the child, and there has been no reported actual physical injury to this child. Um, also, from that case, the common case, discussed the standard of review for the court of an agency's decision. So what's, what's my standard? Your standard is um, to determine whether the department's decision is supported by substantial evidence. And the test is if the cumulative weight of the evidence points to a substantially opposite inference uh, from the department's decision, then it needs to be reversed by the court. So again, because I'm merely reviewing a 51B decision, would it not be substantial evidence that you have a child who's, you know, very sick with flu-like symptoms, with appears to be fever, air issues, um, and and continues to be ill, and parents have refused to um, get medical care for the child. How is that not substantial evidence? Well, the. Uh the facts are that the child was ill, certainly, although the facts, we disagree with the facts as presented that the child did in fact speak to the social worker, didn't speak to the social worker for long, but actually did speak to the social worker and was able to as express his preference um, very coherently to the social worker. Um, certainly the, the parents cooperated with the conversation. There's no allegation that anything in this situation. They were very cooperative. Um, and again, we are dealing with the flu here, or flu-like symptoms, which although can be serious, most commonly, it's not most commonly, it isn't actually even treated by the doctor. There are no cures or medications or things that can be given um, to people with the flu. So uh, the parents position is, is that the, um, the facts are not supportive of a dangerously ill child, which is, as we've discussed, the standard from Macaulay when the state can intervene. Leslie, now your agent um, <laughs> testified or put in a report that, that, that this wasn't a medical emergency. Yes. That, go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't a medical emergency as of that particular time. But um, if they're referring to Macaulay, in Macaulay, the court used a best interest test to determine that the best interest of the child overrules the parent's best interest here. And the court found that the parents, although 
you know, they have constitutionally protected rights bringing up their children. They do not have unlimited rights to make decisions for their children and that the free exercise of religion did not warrant an absolute right to refuse medical treatment for their children on religious grounds. Here we have a child who is not getting better. They keep saying he has the flu. It has not been determined what he has. There has been no medical uh, review. There's no doctor other than the nurse who said that he's pretty sick. They're saying, yeah, he has the flu. How do we know he has the flu? How do we know he doesn't have spinal meningitis? How do we know that this kid isn't going to get worse and die? Well, isn't it in the best interest of the child to have him checked? If the parents cannot see that and understand that, that this child is sick and needs help, and there's help available other than sacrificing the animals, which, by the way, how, how long is it going to take for this uncle to come and perform the ceremony so that we can see if it works or not? The kids get worse. So, my question for the department is, uh, and it goes to the next set of cases that you have. Why didn't you? Why didn't you file a candidate protection case? Exhausted that administrative 
remedy and now <coughs> before me um, in order for me to review the decision. It's overloaded with cases. <laughs> How would you just factually uh, distinguish the uh, custody of the minor case? Um, sort of similarly to, to um, what I heard from the department relative to Macaulay. In terms of the well-being of, of the child. <coughs> the subject of this case. How would you distinguish or use it to support your position as the department? I think it's similar, very similar. They not only were unwilling to provide the proper here under 119.24, but what they were doing for the child was actually causing more harm. So Geneva before, no, I'm sorry, Jamie uh, um, gave the three interest um, relative to um, child welfare medical cases, and you mentioned the state's interest in protecting the children um, in, in, in um, preserving life and then the medical profession's interest. So how would that work in terms of not only, you know, Chad Green, how would you liken Chad Green's condition of leukemia with Jamil's flu? It's not such a simple 
making the child feel worse. So in the parent's best interest, they don't know whether this is gonna cure it or not. They're protecting their child by saying, hey, wait a minute, we don't know what this is. As far as the flu goes, if you pick up the phone and you call a doctor and say, my, my kid has the flu, the doctor's gonna say, well, don't bring him in the office. I don't want anybody else to get sick. <laughs> Keep him home, make sure he's getting yeah. his fluids, make sure he's getting his fluids. If the temperature gets to a certain degree for so many days, then they can come in and have the kid come in. Call today, call right now, I challenge you right I now. I have kids, I have kids. Challenge it's right now. They have a separate <laughs> section. They will, tell you. <laughs> they, will, they will tell you, they will tell you, don't, don't come in for a certain amount of time. It was three days, and the only reason that 51A was filed was because the two-year's daughter had written an essay about something she witnessed, the animal sacrifices in Nigeria back at Christmas time. So had this not, had the teacher not spoken with the nurse and told them about this, yeah. it wouldn't have, so the, the, the whole thing was focused on the animal sacrifice and not the child. Half of the school is out with the flu now. Now, Amy, you just said three days. Suppose it was um, Two. 10 days um, and the, the child is still ill and maybe getting sicker. You didn't give the you didn't give the clients the opportunity to wait for ten days. You didn't give them they didn't have that option. Yes. It wasn't available to them. But, but because Leslie substantiated after three days, you're saying? Yeah, I mean three days they you know they came in and immediately put the neglect and then they did nothing. They didn't force the child to go to the doctor. Not that the doctor could even give them anything to do anyway. But would your answer change if there, if, if it was a longer period of time? It would depend on the situation. Because the case I'm thinking of, and this brings up uh, uh, Ahmed's previous uh, um, point, is the Twitchell case where the child did keep getting sicker and where the parents, in fact, relied on a statute that allowed, a statute, a law, that allowed them to, to um, engage in spiritual practices. Um, and so at first, just like your clients, they were okay in terms of complying with the law. But at some point, the child got sicker and, and in fact, died. Right. Um, so how can that case be differentiated? I realize this case doesn't look as serious right now. Um, by this time, Jamil is probably back in school. Back this is very important. Who knows how long it took you to get here? But, <laughs> but how would you? How would you, you know, differentiate um, Twitchell? You know, especially if you really don't know. You know, for example, even with you know leukemia, um, I have a personal interest in my my grandies have leukemia. We didn't know. You know, you were talking before the, from the state's point of view about uh, somebody mentioned uh, statistics about leukemia. But at first, you join in whether it's a child or an adult. At first, you don't know. It's just a set of symptoms, and they keep getting worse. Um, so how do we know that um, Jamil isn't suffering from leukemia, for example? But the question is, is whether or not the parents fulfill the definition of being neglectful after when a child has right. flu-like symptoms for three days. And the parent's position is that that does not fulfill the definition of neglect according to the, the evidence, and so decisions should be first. Suppose, and uh, I know this takes out of the real realm of all these, uh, my authority of superior court judge, but <laughs> suppose <laughs> Jamil to die, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> uh, <Please>. can, <laughs> That's the thing though, yeah, that I see here, is that Jamil was, at this point, his symptoms to the parents were getting better. Um, if you look at the report, it says uh, household was fine. They were excellent students. They were well dressed. I also called the report uh, Freelander, where it states that the animal sacrifices and other rituals could perhaps create a heightened risk of physical, emotional, or harm to the boy. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much of that statement um, had to do with the 51A being supported in the last. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's a large part of what we're talking about here today, the actual religious beliefs of the parents being put on trial instead of the child being sick and not getting medical care. And, and, and could, um, and this is the question from the department, uh, is it valid, I guess, 
for the agent of, of, of the department Freelander to, to use sort of a future factor uh, in her determination uh, that the 51A should be supported. Again, what Ed pointed out was the statement, Freelander stated that animal sacrifice could, could perhaps create a heightened risk of physical or emotional harm. Well, so can the department do that? Uh, well, well, in fact, the department did it, but I'm saying could it be uh, a, a factor in, in, in finding reasonable cause for the uh, 51A? Geneva? I would say yes, similar to what Stephanie had said earlier. We shouldn't have to wait until a child dies to take action against the parents because we want to be preventative of things harming children. And in this case, that is, that is one other factor that just added to the situation, the fact that she found. But aren't you supposed to be assessing um, the child in his or her condition yes. at, 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 the, at the moment right. and to make a decision of, of whether there's ne neglect or abuse? Right. And in that, in that situation, the investigator was taking into consideration the fact that, that although she could speak quickly with the child, the child was too ill to talk with her in detail about how he's feeling and that she can't go by just what the child said that he doesn't want to see a doctor. No child wants to go to a doctor. Children don't want to do that. So that statement in and of itself doesn't mean that the child really didn't want to be cured or feel better. He just was listening to what So parents. can you argue or are you arguing that the, 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 the medical neglect, even if it's if the, that combined with that it could be worse right. is okay. makes it it makes it worse that it, it's more subs, more evidence to give them reasonable cause to to find that the child was in serious danger or possible danger of getting worse. Isn't this a, wasn't uh, Friedlander's decision, or was Freelander's decision subjective or objective? Subjective. How is it subjective, Sandy? Isn't she supposed to be following department regulations? Shouldn't it be objective? She should be. You're hurting your case. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting over here. It's really difficult for me. I'm sorry. That's why I had to tell you it was before. Thought. No, no, that's what I, you know, that it wasn't. It was not an emergency, and they just 
spacing it, I think that the bigger factor. But does it have to be an emergency no. for Friedlander to support the 51A? And that's no. all I'm reviewing. No. He goes by her observations, but that doesn't mean her observations are 100% accurate because he goes by her perception. Especially where the, the child wasn't being, being sent to school without medical care. The child was at home. The mother was there. The mother was taking care of the child, give, giving the kid fluids. And, I mean, she, they were nurturing and caring for this child. Even though they didn't take him to the doctor, it was only three days before they were accused of like well, you would acknowledge, Council, though, that there are be um, very loving parents, you know, such as the Greens, that still could ultimately, you know, hurt their child. So, Mark? See, I feel that this report by Freelander was based on the fact, like Karen said, that it's based on um, this not being a medical emergency, and she's stressing that this concerning animal sacrifice, and she's probably concluding that subjecting him to animal sacrifice as a child will will sort of be substituted as a child who's abused physically or tortures animals, goes on to kill in, in later life. And I think she's afraid that by subjecting him to animal cruelty, he'll, he'll become one of those abusers himself or criminals. And I think she's taken it to another level because so you're he's not actually doing the animal sacrifice, he's just observing it. And that, to me, is not uh, an emotional or physical harm to the boy. I think she's extrapolating something else upon the boy from this scenario. Are you saying the, the department hasn't sort of taken into account cultural or ethnic differences? I don't think so. That I think the department is, is putting its own white bread persona onto this family. Sandy, you moved over and all you're doing is agreeing, so let's hear from you. <laughs> to, to me, and I thought from the beginning, I believe in kind of, in a, like what Mark is saying, for me it's more like based on, it's, it seems all based on like a bigotry type of thing, that based on the personal belief of, of the investigator. And I just, I, I, for me, I don't see, there's no immediate harm being done to this child. You know, it, it says from the whole fact pattern that this child is being taken care of. Like, like Amy said, the child's being taken care of, the mother's home taking care of the child. It doesn't appear to be any neglect. So just because someone believes that um, their religion is going to save, their ritual is going to save their child, I don't think it's enough to prove neglect in the sense that it's the definition um, of neglect. So how would this case change if, if you were to vary the facts and give me um, a hypothetical in terms of how this case would change to um, cause the department to, like in custody of a minor, actually file a care and protection case to seek medical treatment, what would you have to see happen? I, I would want to know if the child continued to get worse, the children continue to get worse in their condition, if the parents would have even considered bringing it to the hospital and getting medical treatment, if that was even an option for them. It says nowhere in this fact pattern that it says that I'm not asking about the fact pattern, pattern though the, now. The department's I, decision, what it's based on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm asking a hypothetical right now. So. Oh, okay. Well, I just pulled up the um, MGL's chapter 119, section 24. Yeah. And, um, like, if you could show that Jamil was not getting any care or discipline from his parents or that they were just kind of, like, ignoring the situation and maybe not treating him with the uncle that was going to be coming, then maybe you'd have a better argument in that they're not treating him at all and that this ritual or spiritual healing is not appropriate in, in aiding his illness. Uh, because it looks like you need, you need to show that they're without necessary and proper physical or educational care and discipline. Um, it's growing up under conditions that are sound to character development lacks proper attention of the parent, guardian with care and custody, or that they are incompetent or unwilling to provide such care. So if they were just leaving him there with these symptoms without trying to find a way for him to get better, then I feel like we have a stronger argument that, well, we 
we've call, we're calling the uncle and we're going to do a spiritual hearing ceremony and let's see how our son gets from there. I think that more of the issue is that people are looking at it as a bigotry type thing and I think to answer your hypothetical, you would have to have the investigator speak with a doctor that would be able to tell you what could make the flu worse or whether being surrounded by livestock that could be diseased is going to heighten the risk that the child is subjected to. And if that's the case, then yes, the fact that they sacrifice because of their religion, it doesn't matter if it's for the religion or they just it's tradition or whatever they want to do, because if their tradition was to give or their religion was to give vitamins to the child, then I don't think anyone would be having a problem with their religious practices because, you know, a lot of people tend in medical profession think that you should give, you know, juice and whatever to someone who's sick. So if that's their religious practice, it wouldn't be about religion. And everyone's just making it about religion because their religion is different than a lot of other people. But I don't think that's the problem. It's the fact that the child is being subjected to animals that are being killed. They're alive, then they're killed, and then they're eaten, and you don't know what kind of diseases the animal's carrying. It's not being, you know, tested and FDA approved food, things like that. What is no, up? But in, 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 okay, in, in the practice of EFA, you you sacrifice an animal in order to to either extract its goodness or to extract the badness from you into the animal. And an animal that is sacrificed in this case for a child that's sick, the evil goes into the animal when you do not eat it. You only eat the good. Right. <laughs> and I, I, you didn't get a chance to be Mr. Tool. Right? I had a job. <laughs> <laughs> do it now. And while that's all well and good, I do think that that's what should, would support the investigator more is if they had a doctor um, or some physician that was saying that that's not going to help and that could potentially make it worse. Uh, would would your, any of your arguments or answers change if, uh, if, if um, there's a particularly serious flu epidemic? Parents are reasonable in what they're doing. I mean, the, in order to get this child into school, they had to vaccinate the child. They had to conform to some of the to some. exactly that exactly. the states have required. Exactly. So they're not against doing things that are required. They are strictly just going, they're, they're treating their child like anybody else would. You don't know if the child's, you know, a hypochondriac or if the social work was like, you don't know any of that. I mean, you're taking a very subjective look and the only thing that they're talking about is an animal sacrifice. And I think had, had the child, had the daughter not written the essay, this never even would have come there because they would have called the house and said, oh, he's got the flu, oh, keep him home, we don't want him out in the air until he feels better, I hope he does better, I'll send homework home or something like that. Where now it just got blown out of proportion because it was, you know, because of movies today and television and entertainment, you think of animal sacrificing, it's a totally different thought process. It's not, you don't so understand it. Let me ask you all if, I, if you were the judge uh, who, who would affirm the department's Andrew's uh, decision. <laughs> also, most, mostly people would not. I, I, I have another question because I, I, I want to be able to talk about the Twitter case a little bit. So, Paul, and so here's another hypothetical. So it's just by some crazy group, no matter how much they love Jamil and whatnot, he really had something serious and like a brain tumor. Or, I mean, something that he instantly, not instantly, but within you know a week or two, he died. But should and to what extent should the parents now be prosecuted? And for what? <laughs> that that was what you wanted to talk about, right? Yeah. I think that they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. They shouldn't be prosecuted because they really believe that it's not it's not that they did that out of like to intentionally neglect or like well, man manslaughter, what do you know about involuntary manslaughter? Would that work? It wasn't really negligent. I'm not sure. 
I mean, even if they had were to have brought the child to a doctor, different doctors use different treatments. There's no one treatment to cure whatever they suspect might be there. So it'd be difficult to prove that they were negligent in failing to bring the child to a to a doctor because flu-like simple and symptoms can simply be cold, and it could be a combination of things. So you, you can't really determine what it is, and if the child eventually did die of a well, I mean, I mean, mean I Tanya. I believe it's a, it's a serious, um, really serious illness, and um, the parents think that the health is going to be some crisis, and they get from taking the child to the hospital. They'll have to, I guess, just take some action. I'm not saying they have to, um, I, I don't know. Because you want to prevent that to happen in the future. Because if too many kids are going to die, if our parents think that they can do whatever they want and save their child, because that's why they believe it's right for the child. Okay, they're not, they're not wrong, they have good intention, they mean well, but still, somebody's going to die. So, if it's going to end up in, if it's going to happen like that, then they will have to do So, I mean, in Twitchell, they relied on a statute the parents did that at the time, it was a statute for a Christian scientist, where the Christian science practitioner would do sort of an analogous thing to the Babalao in, in, in our case. Their little child did die, and they they were ultimately convicted. They didn't do jail time, but like they were convicted for well, involuntary. There's a distinction, though. In Twitchell, <laughs> oh. go ahead. Well, they, was, go ahead, Mark. In Twitchell, they refused uh, for religious practice not to have any medical care, whereas here they're using as their first uh, row of defense the animal sacrifice, and I believe uh, that the tumors would, if the child became more ill, would then seek medical care, because they are in this country, but not in Nigeria. So they seek doctors all the time, and some of them might get more treatment. I think this is their first means of defense, and it's not so a religion, but not against But again, medical if, the, care. if the child died, are you saying that they couldn't be prosecuted for involuntary manslaughter on sort of like a duty it be to, and they violated that duty wantonly, recklessly, it'd be whatever the, the, the be criminal the state law is. To prove it. And, it, and you'd have to look at the facts and how quickly the child died and, you know, other factors. That, you know. I look at, like, Twitchell and these other cases where these children have leukemia. That what? Or leukemia, cancer, or, or something that's life-threatening. Mm -hmm. These people really believe in their religion. And they believe in going to heaven or, or whatever's going to happen. Yeah. So if your child has a 30, 40% chance of living, if you believe so deeply in heaven and your child going there, it's really hard to say I mean, that you weigh that percentage of preserving life to that afterlife and what you believe in is better than life. Well, what was wrong mentally with the child in um, Twitchell? Um, yeah, she had. Um, Parontinitis, which was caused by a perforation of the bowel, which is basically like diverticulitis or something. Yeah, no, he, he's not but one. that's my point. He had a bowel obstruction, but he just appeared to be sick. They didn't know. Yeah, no. Right. And he they was not really sick for five days. Right, but, yeah. the, but the point is, you usually you don't have a stomach ache for five days. Just like in other illnesses, when you're a parent, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I know my mom, when, if I am sick and I have a sore throat for more than a day and a half, she's like, okay, you should go to the doctor's because that's not normal. And if it doesn't go away right away, you should be seeking, even if you don't take your child to the doctor, you should call. I know that parents do that for little children or something like that, that you should call when you have your child has stomach ache for five days or something wrong, so. It's the same thing that we does do. not agree with that. I know. Having, having a couple of kids, when uh, maybe someone at your age or younger would be complaining about fever or five, but when you have a, a two or three or four year old, it could be a com misery come and goes quickly, and they could just be hungry, but you. you like, I'm hungry. 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 I'm hung
Jamil and, and Twitchell is is a little bit similar. So the you know my question to you is is there the possibility that Jamil was really you know obviously by the time he got the Superior Court judge he's still alive and back in school but um, looking at it from the uh, agency's point of view at least initially could Jamil really be sicker than he appears just like the child in Twitchell that was ultimately obviously sicker than he appeared. Do they actually know that he had the, the problem in Twitchell? Yes. Because uh, we I don't get that information. Oh, because I, yeah. I look at this and I say, you know, if the parents knew we had the bowel obstruction and that a surgery would be corrected, yeah, they didn't know. that's oh. much different than someone having the flu and potentially what it could be. No, so I think that's very, it, those are two completely different. How are they going to know? They yeah. can't. They know. Oh, I saw the TV. Yeah. How does so it hurt the parents to take the kids to the doctors? They just know he was in considerable distress. So I'm yeah. sure for a two and one half year old, it probably meant that he was like screaming and uncomfortable and crying and nonstop. Yeah. For five days, but yeah. that's a long time. For kids. And it did say like even in the absence of their belief in the reliance of spiritual treatment, a, 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 the parents of a child in this condition would normally have sought medical treatment in sufficient time that the child's life. Yeah, that was a very sad case. Yeah. Um, they did, you know, rely on not only their religion but a, a, a statute back then that allowed them to even to do that. Um, there was a lot of publicity around that case. There was a lot of publicity, a lot of publicity. So even though the conviction stood, they didn't do any time just because, obviously, you know, that's what's sad about a lot of these cases. So they don't, they, you know, they. they Fit, you know, you just read us 1924. Mm -hmm. You could certainly fit the circumstances within that loose framework of the allegations of the petition of 1924. But for any, all other reasons, they're, they're parents that really, truly love their children and think that they're doing what's best. And it's all about their 14th Amendment right, plus their First Amendment right as well. Um, but then you've got a balance in the framework, right? the state's interest in preserving life and child welfare and the, and the child's interest and so forth. But I, I, I would um, not affirm um, the agency's um, decision. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with and, and do the same thing that the uh, Superior Court, well, wait a minute, yeah, the Superior Court judge did and ultimately the SJC in the follow up case. I have a question. I mean, in this section, a lot of the cases that we were reading were dealing with, like, the bowel obstruction and yeah. leukemia and yeah. blood transfusions and yeah. stuff. Is this a real case? Which one? The IFA case? I totally made it up. <laughs> <laughs> because my question is, like, I understood, like, the whole argument in that we were asking the court to find that these parents were neglecting their child, and that can look bad on the record, especially for something that may or be small compared to what we've read. Does this happen a lot in the court system? <laughs> well, what, what, what do you mean by this? This meaning an appeal by parents? No, no. Or, um, well, no, I guess <laughs> even um, for the, the 51A hearing and the 51A hearing. There's lots of 51Bs that get supported and, and then there's just services or, you know, no, no CMPs get filed. There's, there are many, um, and then again on the other end, there are very few uh, fair hearing initiations by by parents. When, in terms of the administrative process, it, when you see parents and attorneys litigating administratively, it usually happens because the parents got attorneys as a result of a CMP being filed. Yeah. 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 Also, so yeah. don't have the resources. Exactly. Know that that's, uh, and, you know that that's kind of stick to the record. Right. Until, it's a right. Scary right. Until right. Until right. It is a very scary thought. Um, but in the same vein, you know, uh, parents of uh, children in school also, um, and that's a whole other area of law, the um, education law, also don't realize what their rights um, are. And um, later on, we'll get into, for example, the Chins cases. Um, many times, at least a Chin's attorney, and Karen has acted as a, uh, have, you, have you done educational GAOs? Oh, yes, I um, a lot of it, yeah. um, Will then inform parents of their, of, of their rights and their children's rights educationally. Um, but again, a huge area where, unless 
this uh, ongoing court case, and unless parents has, and, and Maria said, you know, resources otherwise, they're not going to be, um, you know, in, they're not going to be in the, in the system, uh, and they're not going to be, you know, going to the school hearings and arguing for their, um, for their children. So that's a, some of you may have taken education law. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. yeah, okay, so you know. So after spring break, we're going to do the, that whole week, we're going to be doing the adoption cases. So go right to those which are on the syllabus under, under week, I'm sorry, under what, what, what we would have started today, the mass adoption cases, and then what we would have done the Tuesday after vacation. So if you want to get ahead, you can read all of those cases for both Tuesday and Thursday of, um, after we come back. Okay. And the rounds, are those every Monday? They're not every Monday. So whoever okay, has not Tuesday. either responded and gotten, um, give, give me a shout out by email. If we already emailed you, you want to email you again? Yes. Okay. Do you have April's um, I don't have April's yet, so I will be doing that soon. Okay.